It's a real pleasure to be here, to be back. It really is. And just to look out at your faces and see such talent. You know, I, I spend quite a lot of my life praying, visiting and praying in little churches where the average age is, well, a couple of years older than you, maybe. <laughs> and I look forward to the way in which God is calling you and in due course will send you to the four winds to serve. I haven't looked back. Okay, uh, as ever, I think last time you gave me the most obscure passage in Malachi. I have never ever delved into Malachi and that little bit of it before. And now you've given me, is it four verses on the, one of the temptations? It's really good for the preacher. Do you know that, you will know this because some of you preach regularly, the gift of preaching is always for the preacher. And if anyone else gains anything, it's a complete bonus. So I'm speaking to myself today, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful if you want to listen. Um, the devil took Jesus to a high mountain. I wonder if that has any echoes for you from the Old Testament. Let me read to you from Exodus 19, verse 4, a moment. The Lord took Moses up a high mountain and offered him the covenant. All this I give to you, he said, if you will listen to my voice and keep my commandment. You will be my treasured possession out of all the peoples, for the whole earth is mine, but you will be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. And what followed from there that includes the giving of the Torah, the Ten Commandments, summed up in the Ten Commandments, but so much more, is what, in effect, brings us here today as the covenant that has been opened up to include even us, well, I'm assuming myself at least, a Gentile. And a few chapters after that in Exodus, the people led by Moses are still at Mount Sinai, but in chapter 32, again at the mountain of God, what happens? The people get distracted. They get a bit desperate. They can't see God. They can't see Moses. And they melt their jewelry, and they make a golden calf, and they bow down in a different kind of worship. Breaking, incidentally, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before you. The second commandment, you shall not make an idol. And the final commandment, you shall not covet. How many commandments can you break at once? I mean. And what happens? That covenant is tested. In fact, it's threatened to breaking point. But because Moses is faithful, because of Moses' intercession, because of Moses' prayer, it ends up being reinforced unconditionally. And you get at that fantastic revelation of God's mercy in chapter 34. Okay, that's probably as much Old Testament as you were looking for today. I can get carried away on the Old Testament, you understand. But I want you to hear the parallel with Matthew chapter 4. The devil took Jesus up to a very high mountain and offered him all the kingdoms of the world. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship. How many commandments can one break at once? Here again is an invitation to have another God, to make an idol, and to covet, to covet the kingdoms of the earth. What we have in parallel, if you like, is a picture with Moses of archetypal faithfulness, threatened with by Satan, 
with quite a strong record from the Old Testament people of God, a picture of archetypal failure. Now, if you've got a Bible or a phone or whatever, do find Matthew chapter 4, because that narrative about the temptations follows immediately after Jesus' baptism. What is baptism about? But the recognition of God's covenant with his people, God's promise to us. Jesus has just been baptized. That is to say, his ministry is just opening up as the heavens opened up. As he comes out of the water and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove, and a voice declares, again, echo, hear the echo from Exodus 19. Here is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. What did God say to Moses? You will be my treasured possession out of all the peoples of the earth. The whole earth is mine, but you, you, emphasized, will be to me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Friends, can you imagine God saying that to you? I wonder if you remember your baptism. I wonder if you heard that declaration of God's love, God's claim, God's delight in your life. Here is my child, the one I love the one in whom I delight. I hope you hear that regularly and take it deeply, as I imagine some of you are starting out in ministry, formal or informal. I don't mind. Now, what happens next? Do you want to run headlong into failure in the service of God just the minute you're commissioned or baptized or ordained or whatever your system is? If you do, listen up. <laughs> and if you don't, please also listen up. If you, if you, if you, none of us want failure. But beware. If you focus on outcomes rather than on the one who calls, who loves, who delights in you, you are vulnerable. The devil comes to Jesus with three offers, three possible outcomes. The first is bread. The second, let's call it stunts. And the third is kingdoms. What do you fancy? What do you want? What are you going to get from ministry? Quite a common question. How much are you going to be paid? What are you going to do? What are you going to lead? What are you going to command? All of those questions are related to the questions the devil poses to Jesus. Because the devil is focusing on outcomes. What did God focus on? You are my child, my beloved. I love you to bits. I am with you. I know, I know you've looked at all three temptations, except that I think you missed one. You kind of leapfrogged. So I am going to look at all three briefly, and then I promise you I'm going to focus on the third. The first temptation... Command these stones to become loaves of bread, verse 3. The desire to be independent of the grace of God, to have food on demand and one's future secure, which is something, let's face it, Israel always wanted, not least when they were wandering around in the wilderness, not quite sure that God's promises were going to come about. No need for faith. Let's have jam today. Gratification instantly. To get what you want, to buy what you need, 
it's just what my parents, who lived through the war, wanted so badly for me and my brothers. Because they knew insecurity. They wanted us to be self-contained so that we wouldn't have to depend on anyone or anything. It's packaged these days, perhaps in the language of human rights, given that we live in the West, also with a range of choice. Can you picture the devil inviting you to choose from a variety of different stones? Would you like granary or sourdough? We could get fussy. The second temptation, for Jesus to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple, knowing that the angels are there to bear him up. Here's the invitation to bravado, to be the commando pastor, the youth worker with the greatest stunts and the most dramatic testimony. I always used to get jealous of those who had a really good testimony because mine was dull. As if to force the hand of God, given how many people it will impress. Indeed, who are you trying to impress? God? Really? And why do you need to impress anyway? Is this about cults of celebrity in our church? Who or what is your ministry going to be about? Lord, have mercy if it's about you. And number three, the last temptation, I think, is about power. All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me, verse 9. Now, how many kingdoms do you have now? And how many more do you want? Like the billionaire who is typically asked, how much money, ideally, does one need? And the answer always comes back, just a little bit more than I have now. At the heart of this temptation is the seduction of power, that sense that it can be packaged and delivered to you on a silver platter, and you'll know when you've got it, and you'll be happy and satisfied. You'll feel great, perhaps all puffed up above it all. Really? And the means to that power to submit to one whose claim to power is false. To gamble such power as we have been given by giving it away to a destructive cause. Friends, that is a counsel of despair. And yet, it is such a common path. Now, those three temptations, bread, stunts, power, translate roughly, classically, into money, sex, and power. All of them different ways of living without God, of putting myself at the center, that, in effect, I may play God. Of the seven deadly sins, I think, in the end, they all boil down to one, and it's called vanity. To that insecurity that requires us constantly to check we are loved, to test if God delights in us, and to bolster our ego just in case he doesn't. To the temptation to deny those words declared at baptism which God sings over each one of us. Here is my child, my beloved in you I am well pleased. As if those words were conditional. No, here is the new covenant. The repetition of the one made at Sinai. If you will hear my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be a treasured possession among all people. All the earth is mine, but you, you, you will be my priestly kingdom and holy nation. 
That covenant now is opened up to anyone and everyone, not just the Israelites, but to those of us who are Gentiles. And to each of us, that declaration of God's love, the invitation to discipleship, the partnership in God's purposes, that's the invitation to ministry. I presume it's what you are focused on and committed to personally and professionally for the future. I don't mind what selection system or leadership structure you're part of in the church. For all of us, it begins at baptism with the utter security of God's declaration to each of us. You are my child, the one I love, the one in whom I delight. Just let those words sink in for a moment afresh. They are the marvel that turns our world on its axis and undergirds our very being, enabling such freedom as we know for prayerful, faithful, confident discipleship. And they are the irresistible truth that will draw others to follow along the same path. Okay, my task is to focus on the third of those three temptations, the temptation to power. So here goes. To hold all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor in my palm. Do you know I struggle with that? You look around in our world at those who supposedly hold power well, I look around, I can't think of anything worse. The pressure of office, the loneliness of the position. Just look at Theresa May today, or Donald Trump, or Vladimir Putin. I don't see them having a lot of fun. Perhaps I'm warped. I just see the weight of the papers to read after dinner before tomorrow's round of meetings and the sleepless night of worry in between and the media reports that are probably delivered over breakfast and I feel desperate. I'm willing to bet they all say regularly to themselves, why ever did I want this job? So I may be a great disappointment to you, but I'm seriously tempted, bishop as I am, to convince you that I'm not one who is tempted by power. But wait a minute. Offer me a role with endless staff, a nice palace or two, and plenty of levers. You know, levers with which to reshape global development or broker peace in the Middle East or even just to bring reconciliation to a village near me where relationships have broken down and there's local fallout. Offer me those things, I'm right there. I'm all over it. So I have to confess, I think I do love power. I just have to work out where and how. I suspect we each have to find our own way into this story to identify the kind of temptations to which we're susceptible when it comes to power. I want to tell you a story. A few years back, I got a phone call out of the blue when I was job hunting between jobs and not having a lot of success with any of my applications. <coughs> It was from someone I studied with 25 years ago at a college a bit like this. His name is Justin Welby. Out of the blue, I don't know how he got my number. Well, actually, I do know how he, I learned later how he got my number. He phoned and he said, you won't remember me. Of course, I recognized the voice straight away. And you don't know what's been happening. Well, I guessed straight away. There was no Archbishop of Canterbury at that time. He said, please don't tell anyone else, but I am the Archbishop of Canterbury elect. And I just wonder if you might help me in that role 
as my chaplain, my, my personal private secretary, if you like. Now, understand, I just needed any job, yeah? But Justin well be called, and I couldn't have been more excited. I tried to sound mature and, you know, spiritual over the phone. I said, let me pray about this, <laughs> and I'll call you back in a few days' time. But in reality, I was ready to start that afternoon. He wasn't even archbishop yet. Admittedly, not the one holding high office, but the one right beside the one holding high office. And with someone I knew I would get along well with and have a lot of fun with. <clears throat> so, for three and a half years, there I was, servicing the Archbishop of Canterbury, advising, holding his confidences, there was barely an idea or a meeting that I didn't help organize or shape or discern or wasn't present at or indeed arrange who else should be present. I was in on it, based at Lambeth Palace. That was only one of the palaces. <laughs> and then I had to travel with him, oh shucks, all over the world sometimes traveling ahead of him to set things up to the lofty kingdoms of which this text invites us to dream. I sat in meetings in the cabinet office at number 10, admittedly around the edge of the cabinet table, not in the middle, the corridors of Buckingham Palace, the World Bank, the IMS, Davos, the Vatican, you name it. I'll name drop for you if you like. Hobnobbing with VIPs, even if as a fly on the wall. But please don't think I didn't enjoy it. I'm fessing up here because perhaps I am still fascinated by it. I've seen power close up and I loved being close. Even if I didn't for a moment want any of their roles. The power for me was in the trust, in holding some state secrets. If not making decisions, then helping the decision makers, feeling close to the heart of influence. Okay, enough about me. But I describe my own story about power to illustrate something about how we can kid ourselves. There is no more dangerous place to be in regard to temptation than the place of self-deception, the state of lacking in self-awareness. I urge you, know yourself, know your quirks, know your fears, know your seductions, know your vulnerabilities. If it's not about power in the raw sense of sitting on the throne, is it about influence or popularity or needing to be needed or competitiveness, you know, outdoing the person I'm sitting next to? Or staff, is it about tenure? Is it about jealousy? Is it about being the power behind the throne, if not the one on the throne, sometimes more negatively described as manipulation or game playing? Know thyself and name it before God. Name it to a friend who can remind you, lest you forget. For all your zeal to make a missionary journey in God's world, with God's gospel, don't be afraid, indeed I'd regard it as imperative, that you also equally make a journey within, within yourself. I want to just tell you another story quickly. I, I used to teach Old Testament in a college much like this, and I remember having a conversation, it was a a sort of personal tutorial conversation, I don't know if you have pastoral tutors like that, when uh, after listening to a student who I was very fond of 
complain for about a year about his girlfriend, and then come to me saying, this was our very last meeting, saying, so I'm, I'm really confused, I'm really wrestling about whether she is the one for me, the one to marry. And I said to him, I wonder if you need to go and talk to somebody about yourself, a mentor, a spiritual direct. No, he said, I need someone to get to know her and tell me if she's the one. And I, I stepped up, I mean, I knew him quite well at this point, and I said, excuse me, but I sense this situation might not be about her. I wonder if it's about you, your level of courage, your willingness to leave this place and go into ministry without a partner, your capacity for once to say no, he was really cross with me, telling me that spiritual directors were a waste of time because you tutors seem to be more interested in navel-gazing than about the mission of God in the world. I tell you that story because I'm still in touch with him. He has a fantastic position of leadership as it happens, but he, every time I see him, he says to me how grateful he is for somebody to stop him in his tracks at that point. He's still a little bit embarrassed, and, and I should say so am I. But it was a gamble that worked. Friends, if we don't know ourselves, our own longings, if we don't recognize the power we already have, and if we can't voice our, our needs, our longings, we are dangerous pastors because we may not have the self-knowledge, the clarity of focus, the confidence to say no that will see us through the wilderness. I'm sure you know that quote about power from Lord Acton, whoever he was, some Victorian figure in Parliament. Baron, Baron, I think he was. Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I, I, I googled it before coming here last night, and it follows great men, I'm sure he meant women as well, are almost always bad men. That's what follows. And do you know who he wrote it to? In a letter to an Anglican bishop. <laughs> That really tickled me. I urge you to look honestly at your temptations. And if you can't see them, ask someone else who knows you well to be really honest. And to ask, what do they tell about you? I believe God's intention is not simply that we avoid, resist, or flee temptation, but that we learn from it. We use it to fire our spiritual growth in areas of life that we are prone to neglect. Note that it was the Spirit of God that led Jesus into the desert for 40 days and nights. It was not Jesus going astray. It was the Spirit of God. It was not a terrible mistake, nor was it punishment for a terrible mistake. The wilderness is the place for deep learning. Friends, if any of you feel like you're in the wilderness right now, seek to open yourself to God rather than crowd down, crouch down with frustration or, or anger. If the mountain is the classic place for encountering God, the place of theophany, Sinai, the transfiguration, the wilderness is the classic place for encountering oneself. Don't run away.
That's why St. Anthony and so many of the other desert fathers chose the wilderness. They went out into the desert to get away from it all, to focus on God, and to be stripped, to be assured that they were indeed worshipping God alone. Think about Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of uh, fire by night. I ask you, did it take 40 years to cross the desert on the journey from Egypt to the promised land? No, no. If you work out their route, you discover the people of God were led by God around in circles. This was a 40-year invitation to boot camp, to their equivalent of the process of a theology degree and spiritual direction, you know, for their education and formation, in order to be the sort of people who could appropriately take responsibility for the promised land, in order that they could live faithfully and reflect the covenant God was giving them. Friends, if it was one thing for God to get Israel out of Egypt, it turns out it was quite another to get Egypt out of Israel. It took 40 years. Now, it may be that London School of Theology is your wilderness, your time of root and branch pruning and clearing and learning and clarifying. It may be that this Lent is your wilderness, possibly a chosen wilderness, a self-induced wilderness, where you learn to live by faith, where we learn to depend on God, to give us each day our daily bread, our manna, to learn how and where regularly to say no, where we learn not to be led by our need or our desire, but to be led by God. The hard way, discovering perhaps what brings us to fall down, what makes us vulnerable, where that which presents as temptation can become the focus for the Spirit's work in our lives and the opportunity for our spiritual growth. And what is going to help us withstand temptation? As I said, temptation can be clarifying and strengthening. It can strengthen us so long as we can resist. What is going to help you and me to resist? I think I'm stating the obvious here, but I'm going to state it anyway. Four things I've got. Remember and recall the song of your baptism. So well, so deeply, its tune is one that you hum deep down within your soul throughout the ups and downs. You are my son, you are my daughter, you are my child. I love you, I delight in you. Don't be afraid to expose the limits of the extent to which you've received that song. Dwell on it in the knowledge that you are precious and loved. You are the one in the palm of God's strong hand. Number two, immerse yourself in the scriptures so that when there is a taunt, you have a ready answer. That's what we see with Jesus. There's nothing like God's word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is stronger than your no. It is stronger than your own voice. 
Soak yourself, immerse yourself in the scriptures. Know them. Remind yourself of them. Study them, not just when you're forced to study them. I think I, I, I've worked for many years in South Sudan, where for about three generations, homes and livelihoods, villages have been wiped out. The Bible has been translated into most of the vernacular languages, but over and over again, I mean, often illiteracy is a problem, but even where the word of God was, it was destroyed or it became fire lighter for something more urgent. And I would ask, how do you know the word of God? And over and over again, I got the story back, the answer back, I've learned it. I carry it inside. That's a deep challenge to me. We haven't got time to, you know, what is this, to bring some heavy Bible out? Do you happen to have it in your bag? Okay, you have your phone, but what if the battery's gone flat? You need the Word of God inside to hand. And what does the Word of God do? It helps us, quite apart from quoting it powerfully, it helps us to discover that we're part of a bigger story. It puts my story in a wider perspective. It's not just me in the palm of God's hand. I'm one of God's holy people, his holy nation, his priestly kingdom. I'm a player in the story with a role, and at the same time, I am not the be-all and end-all. Okay, number three, go find a mountain and climb it. The mountain of God is archetypally the place of encounter. Go there for one purpose and one purpose alone, to meet with God and talk with God. Of course, it doesn't have to be a mountain. Find a place to retreat. To be put in our place, to be overwhelmed again, to hear the still small voice, to get perspective. Doesn't matter whether it's Sinai or transfiguration. We don't retreat alone. Take a holy friend with you, someone who will help you to pray to share, to process, and to be held to account. Number four, lastly, remember that worship is not the means to an end. What does the devil invite Jesus to do? All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship. What is the purpose of worship? to be with God, to love God, to bow down and offer our lives. We do not worship God for an outcome. We bow down to the maker of heaven and earth because God is worthy. Because it, he is the God with whom our story begins and with whom our story ends and in whom we find our being and through whom we might just manage to get over ourselves. I spoke earlier about cultivating the confidence and the capacity to say no. I want to end by revising the temptation narrative, looking at it again from a wider gospel angle. It seems to me it's definitive for more deeply understanding Jesus' mission and ministry beyond the temptation narrative. That is to say, what he embraces as well as what he rejects. On the face of it, Jesus appears to say no several times over. No to turning stones into bread. No to jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. And no to ruling the kingdoms of the world. We need to learn to say no. But as the gospel unfolds, whether you follow Matthew's account or Luke's account, there is a way of seeing how each of those temptations is not only rejected and suppressed, 
but is equally fitted into a larger story. Jesus says no to three paltry offers. Satan turns out to look tragically small-minded and pathetic within a story which is much, much larger. That is to say, fundamentally, there is a yes. The yes of God to incarnation, the yes of God to resurrection. As I said at the beginning, the first temptation, command these stones to become loaves of bread, is the desire to be independent of the grace of God, to have food on demand, secure one's future, just as Israel always wanted. Jesus, of course, says no to that gimmick, but he says yes to bread, over-accepting, if you like, in the words, this is my body, broken for you. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Jesus offers us bread. The second temptation, to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple, knowing the angels will bear him up, is, if you like, the desire to be the priest of priests, to force God's hand as the sacrifice God can't refuse. But throughout the gospel story, Jesus fulfills not his own will, but the Father's will. The resurrection is the Father's thorough endorsement of Jesus' whole life as the manifestation of the kingdom, of Jesus throwing himself down. Jesus says yes to the temple, not as a high diving board, but as the new temple, his body, his church. And then the last temptation about power. All these, he says, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me, says the devil. And Jesus says yes to power, to the power of God in the power of humility and weakness. Kenosis, Philippians 2. Jesus says yes to peace, but peace can only come through the worship of the living God. So in one sense, Jesus over accepts the temptation that the devil offers in his ascension, because what do you know? He rules now at the right hand of the Father over every kingdom on earth. Jesus says yes to the kingdoms because he's the king who reigns, who reigns from the cross. The kingdom of God is crowned as he empties himself. Friends, this is the journey we are invited to take, to empty ourselves in love of God, because God first loved us. Hear again the words of your baptism. You are my beloved. You are my son, my daughter. In you I delight. <laughs>